y bendecimos a todos eh, ahora en el nombre de Jesús, salúdense unos a otros, aleluya, gloria a Dios, amén. Aleluya, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Aleluya. Amen. All right. We welcome everybody online. We thank you for being with us. And uh, yeah, we're going to dismiss our child <laughs> and our teacher. <laughs> Okay, we're going to pray for them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, using uh, uh, Emily to teach Salome in Jesus' name for the anointing and the power to uh, inspire the love for Jesus and the love for the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, so... Okay, Miss Jamie. Okay, yeah. You can go now to your class, uh, Miss Salome. Okay, and uh, Jamie, si me haces el favor de, de poner los audífonos, puede ser un solo oído para ver si puedes escuchar a Pamela. No tiene que ser todo el servicio, pero solo como prueba. Okay. All right. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're glad to, to be here. And uh, share the, the word of God together. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody. We welcome everybody online. And uh, we're talking about a series of messages on uh, blood covenant or covenant by sacrifice. And um, we really uh, have been learning a lot. Uh, about our relationship, you know, with the Lord. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, we, we many times we tell people, you know, the Lord is not looking for a religion, but a relationship. Do you agree with me? And, and the truth is that um, we ourselves don't know uh, many times how is that relationship really established, you know, because uh, we think it's maybe a friendship, maybe it's a fatherhood, and it's all of those, but at the same time, what we have been learning uh, in this series is that this relationship is actually a covenant, and so um, we really don't understand covenants in our culture, uh, you know, we talk more about a contract or a um uh, agreement, um, you know, but really not, uh, uh, you know, very, very few times we say, oh, I'm going to make a covenant with somebody, <laughs> right? You don't say, okay, um, I have a covenant with God, uh, and we say it, but we really don't understand what it means. And so what we have been learning is that it's really more like a marriage. You belong to each other. You give completely yourself to the other, and the, and, and, and the other person gives completely themselves to you. So uh, in the case of marriage, that's true. And actually, the Word of God does say that we are um, actually, uh, I I when we get married, we actually are in a covenant, and, and it is a covenant relationship. Uh, so to understand this, uh, really, um, 
you know, I was, I was uh, studying a little bit about this, and we have this about the, the Native American Indians here in the United States. And when they did um, a, a peace treaty, and they smoked the peace pipe and all that, that was actually a form of a covenant. But the settlers didn't understand too much what was involved in that. For the Indians, it was like, if we, we smoke this peace pipe together, we're in covenant. You're going to protect me, and I'm going to protect you. You have my army, and you have, and, and, and you have, my, and, uh, you have my army, and, and I have your army. Okay? And so, uh, when, but the settlers didn't quite catch that, so they were looking for the first opportunity to actually break that covenant. And, um, and it, it was absolutely, um, you know, astonishing for, for, the Indi for the Native Indians. But anyway, um, this is true in Africa. This is true in the Middle East. And what we have been learning is that um, there is actually a, um, in this agreement that we're talking about, like a marriage with the Lord, the, the, the terms of the covenant it's not just a set of rules. It's more like a marriage vows. You don't say your marriage vows because you, you feel obligated to say them, okay? You, you do your marriage vows because you love the person, right? And you want to do all this that you're promising to do because out of love, you want to do all this for this person, take care of them, share everything, you know, make uh, their breakfast. I don't know. Whatever you said in your in your vows, <laughs> uh, you know, it, different people do different vows, and uh, you know. But the point is that uh, you do all this because you love the person, not because you want to set a uh, set of rules that you are going to be forced to do or anything. It's not like a you know, like a religion or a philosophy. Is a relationship, and you want to do all this. So when the Lord uh, does the terms of the covenant in his word, he is actually saying everything out of his love for us, what he will do for us, and also out of his love, what he expects from us. <laughs> Amen? Because, uh, you know, the covenant goes in both directions. It's a relationship with God, uh, and, and, and it works both ways. Um, okay, so uh, it is actually based on the love of God, amen? And uh, it's not, you know, if we understand this to start with, you know, it's not uh, something that we mm, just do out of obligation and a set of hard rules but it's more like uh, out of our love for the Lord, we want to do this. Out of devotion, out of uh, uh, his love towards us. His love towards us should produce a reaction in our life. You agree? I, I mean, you know, it, it, my dog, you know, I come home and she's a very nice dog. And, and she's happy when she sees me. And I don't want to. I, I don't want to uh, feel like I'm obligated to pet her or to give her a hug, just because you know I'm supposed to do it because I'm the owner of the dog. Or no, it, she's so loving that I want to react to her love by petting her, by feeding her, or whatever. My wife is better with my dog than I am. She walks her, which is actually a demonstration of the love for a pe <laughs> for a pet. But the point is that um, because of uh, th this animal's love towards me, I, I react towards her. How much more should we react to the love of God? Amen. He has provided such a great uh, relationship with us that um, it, it shouldn't be like a, 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 a burden or an uh, obligation to uh, to do what he wants us to do, you know. If you're married, uh, and you you know, and, and your spouse has, you know, I like to go to a restaurant 
because I like this and this food. You want to do that for, for, for them because out of love, even if you don't like that food. Amen. <laughs> My wife likes to watch this um, Victorian romantic movies. And I feel like I enter into the sleeping zone when I... <laughs> but I want to watch them with her sometimes because she likes them. It's like she was saying she liked this um, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese, um, uh, Chinese food restaurant that they're going to... Uh, chain food restaurant that they're going to pl uh, put a new one close by. And she, she was saying, I can't wait till they put that new restaurant in there. And I don't like that food, but I, I was saying, yeah, I can't wait either. And, and, and my son said, but I thought you didn't like that food. And I said, yeah, but she's excited about it. I'm excited about it, <laughs> you know, because in a relationship, what excites the other person should excite you. Amen. <laughs> and um, so what God, there's so many things that God is excited about. Uh, that we should be excited about. Uh, we should be in complete agreement what, what, with what he wants. And obviously, because he, gives, he gave his song, son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, obviously, he's very, very interested in salvation of people. He's so excited about people getting saved and filled with the Holy Spirit that he gave his son he sent his Holy Spirit, everything he did. <laughs> he sent his word, his word, he is the word, the word is God, God is the word. So everything that he is, he has placed to save people and fill them with the Holy Spirit and send them into their purpose in life. Amen. We should be as excited about that. You know, I don't understand when people, when there's an altar call at the end of the service, and, and, and we're inviting people to get saved. And that's when people start getting up and leaving the service. That's the point where they should stay and pray the hardest for people to get saved. And, you know, because y your, your disinterest in, in that part means that for the newcomer is like, ah, it must not be important. Maybe, maybe I need to leave now. And, and, and so we could lose a great opportunity to, for somebody to get saved if we actually don't get excited about what God is, is excited. Amen. And so that when, when we do an altar call or salvation call, you know, or, uh, you know, or minister to people, you know, for healing or whatever it is, God also pay a great price for people to be healed. So if during a, 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 a call, you know, an altar call for healing, People start getting up and leave because they say, oh, okay, the service is, this part is not so important. Let's just leave. Well, you know what? That's the part where God paid the greatest price by his stripes, by his wounds. We, he, we were healed. So that means he paid with his own flesh and blood being torn apart for us to be healed. Okay, so... We should be excited about what he is excited, and that's, that's real love, I tell you. <laughs> okay, so, you know, one of the differences that we study in between a um, uh, covenant and a contract is that a contract is based on distrust, uh, on, on lack of trust for the other party, right? It's like... Um, uh, I don't want them to cheat me out of something, so I made a contract to protect myself from them cheating me and, 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 you know, doing something wrong against my property or something, you know, so I made a contract. So a contract is made out of lack of trust, but a covenant is made because of trust and love. You trust the person, you know, if we said marriage is like a covenant, then you don't want to marry somebody because you don't trust them. Oh, I don't trust them. They might be going with somebody else, so I better get married with them so they don't know. Uh, so if you don't trust them, and that's the, the area where you don't trust them, 
don't get married. <laughs> don't make a covenant with somebody you don't trust. That's why it's so good to make a covenant with God, because you, because you can trust him completely. He has this kind of, uh, uh, you know, this, this is a phrase that is most repeated in the Bible. The Lord is good and his mer uh, mercy endures forever. That's the phrase that is most repeated in the Bible. And I, I, I'll tell you what, that uh, word mercy actually could be translated, and it would be very well translated if it's translated covenant love. So you could say, the Lord is good, and his covenant love endures forever. So he is a God that has not just a love for us, he has a covenant love for us. And uh, I, I want to look at this um, probably, um, it's not in my notes, but let's go there. I think I, I know what it is. It's, uh, I believe it's Deuteronomy 7. And uh, it's around verse 7. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys can see uh, the Spanish version. Is it too small? Is the one on the on the left? I need to make it bigger. I promise I'll work on that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, uh, Deuteronomy seven. Um, okay. Let me see. Okay. There it is. Deuteronomy 7.7, 7. it says, is, is God talking, in this context, is God talking with the Israelites? And it's talking about the covenant. And um, in verse 7, it says, the Lord did not set his affection. Uh and, and in Spanish, I'm going to read in Spanish. El Señor, se encariñó, no, el Señor se encariñó contigo y te eligió, aunque no eras el pueblo más numeroso. And in and, and English, it says, The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. So um, it really wasn't because Israel was the greatest and most numerous people that God loved them. In fact, he said, you are like the fewest people, <laughs> the smallest guys. It's, it's not because they were so impressive. You know, God didn't choose you because you were so impressive. But when you receive him in your heart and, sur and surrender your life to him, he will be impressive in you. He'll make you impressive. <laughs> Because you will be one with him. In verse 8, it says, But it was because the Lord loved you, and he kept the oath, his word, he swore to your ancestors that he brought um, uh, you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery. From the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So it says that, you know, he set you free from slavery. You know, we're, we were all slaves to sin. You agree? We, we were uh, in, in the sinful nature. We were slaves to it. But he set you free because he loved you. Not because you were so impressive, so numerous or something. Uh, and, and God loves this church not because we are so numerous, because we're small, but he loves us because he is a, 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 a covenant-loving God that loves you, loves us. Amen. And so, um, and, um, in, this, in this verse, verse 8, when uh, we read the word loved, Um, okay, is, is, is one word that is used 
uh, is not the one that we are, are lo I'm looking for, but is is uh, to be loved. Uh, it can refer to a friendship, a family love, romantic love, or covenant loyalty. So one of the meanings of this word loved is covenant loyalty. Okay, so uh, that's an interesting word right there, right? And then um, notice that he says he kept his oath. Because he loved you, he kept his oath. So it's the same thing on our end. We, because we love him, we need to keep our part of the covenant. And so when you enter into a covenant, actually, it could be called an oath. Okay? You're, have you, you know, I've seen movies. I don't know if you've been ever in a jury or whatever or be a witness in a uh, um, judicial uh, court law case or whatever, but, uh, you know, they ask you to swear on the Bible, and you're now you're under oath to say the truth and only the truth and the whole truth, not just partially the truth, right? And so if you ever break that and you, you tell a lie when you're under oath, you're in serious trouble, right? This is not like just, oh, it's okay, We'll fix it. No, <laughs> you're going to jail. <laughs> Amen? Because it's serious when you break an oath. But how much more an oath that is based on a blood covenant? Amen? So God makes an oath. He swears. He promises something to do something. A very solemn promise. Uh, based on a blood covenant. Okay. So he was so serious about this. That when they were slaves. He said I'm going get, to get, get you out. You're my people. I'm your God. And you're not going to be slaves. I'm going to get you out of slavery. Amen. And he will get you out of any condition or situation or problem. That is not his will for you to be in. He has swore for you to no, not to be a slave uh, financially, not to be a slave. If you have a, a lot of debts and, and you're, you know, you, you're actually a slave to the system, to the financial system. He doesn't want you to be a slave of that. He'll get you out of debts. You need to learn how to start paying the small debts until you have more money to pay the big debts and get out of debt. And he will prosper you when you decide to put your finances in the divine order. Amen? In the area of healing. Healing, the Bible says, is an oppression of the devil. He loves you, and he doesn't want you to be oppressed as a form of slavery. So he wants you out of sickness into healing and, 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 and health. Divine health. Not only just healing. You know, healing is good because when you're healed, uh, glory to God, there's help. But there's another level where you can walk in divine healing. We're, we're striving for that. <laughs> it's not that we're perfect or anything. But we're learning how to walk divine healing. You know, um, I remember a, a preacher that we like, uh, he already went on to be with the Lord, uh, Brother K uh, Kenneth H uh, Hagen. And he he said one time he got really sick. I can't remember what was, if it was a, uh, uh, a problem with his uh, cold or something. Um, and and he was sick. So he asked the Lord what, what was wrong, and, and basically... He needed to adjust some things in his life to where his calling, his main calling was to be a prophet. But he was putting his teaching ministry above his prophetic ministry. In his case, not, not in every case is like that. So, so there are some people that are teachers and prophets, and that's good. And, and, but they mainly are teachers, and then they're prophetic, and that's fine. But in his case, the prophetic gift was above the calling of God. And so, but he was treating it, treating it like a lesser 
calling. And that got him into a, uh, uh, a place where the devil could attack him in, in his health. Okay. So sometimes we, we're not just uh, 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 treating the, the main calling or, or, or the priorities of God the way they should be treated. We he had different priorities, you know. And, and that's wrong. And we need to repent and fix it. So sometimes the devil has access because we have the, our priori priorities in the wrong place. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so. Um, but notice that he had an oath. So uh, many times when, when the Bible talks about an oath, it's, it's actually referring to the, the um, commitment from the two parties of the um, uh, covenant. To fulfill uh, the, the terms of the covenant. Okay? That's an oath. Because, I mean, we, uh, that, this is the way they do it. We, we've been learning that, right? They would um, cut an animal or, or several animals in half. Then they put the two pieces apart from each other. And you can read this in Genesis 15 but we don't have time to read it. When God made a covenant with Abraham, right? But and, and imagine this. You know how much is involved in cutting a, a, a cow in half? Do you know the bloody mess that this is? There's a bloody path between these two halves of the animals. So in the case of uh, God and Abraham making a covenant, this very serious commitment, God asked him to bring a goat, a ram, una cabra, un carnero, and I was saying the words in Spanish, and a cow. <laughs> okay, so imagine these three animals, and he said, cut them in half. This is Genesis 15. You have to read it on your own. And uh, separated the, the halves of these three animals certain distance uh, op opposite each other. That's what it says there. And now the people that were going to do the covenant were supposed to uh, walk this bloody path to and say the terms of the covenant that they, that was the oath that they were going to fulfill and walk around the pieces like in a form of a uh, infinity <laughs> right uh, symbol like an eight symbol some you know, like that, in that shape. And, and, and they would uh, say the terms of the covenant that they were committing, or the oath that they were doing. And uh, what happened at this point in Genesis 15 is that Abraham goes to sleep. Because God had promised him uh, to have a child from Sarah, and his descendants would be as many as the stars. He said, count the stars if you can. And, and have you ever tried to count the stars? That's a big job. And, and so there's billions of stars. And so, and then he says, and, I, and your descendants will have this land. And Abraham says, hey, how do I know? And God says, well, let me tell you, bring a calf, bring a goat, bring a ram, and two, two birds, the birds don't have to cut in half, but the big animals, yeah. You know how much is involved in cutting an animal in a half with the insides and everything in the middle, right? And now, when Abraham was supposed to walk in between the pieces of the animal, he goes to sleep. I don't know if God put some, uh, something to sleep in his drink or something. <laughs> Whatever it is, he was in a deep sleep. The rest, he's, I guess, he's dreaming about what God is doing. So the one that walks in between the pieces of the animals is not Abraham. It is God. It, it looks like a, a smoking furnace. And then also uh, a torch, a flaming torch is seen between. And you know what they symbolize? They symbolize the Father. That smoking furnace that is the glory of the Father that torch, Jesus is the light of the world. He, 
they were actually Jesus and, and God the Father were the ones that made the covenant to fulfill the promises to Abraham. And that is called an oath. And I was going to read you something else, but uh, I guess we can do it next time we, we talk about this. But I want to go to um, Hebrews. I'm going to try to finish the idea with this. Something I wrote here I need to read. God's covenant enables you. Since the Bible says that faith works by love. And that word work works there. In the Greek is the word energy. You could read it. Uh, uh, faith. Uh, the energy of faith is the love of God. You can read it that way. Or you can read it this way. God's covenant love is the energy of faith. God's covenant love is the energy of faith. That means that my faith has actual energy and power and works because of the Loyal covenant love of God towards me. You know, have you ever tried to trust somebody that you can trust? You cannot trust like, you know, they say they're going to do something and they, and you know, they're not going to do it. And then you say, okay, I knew that. <laughs> I really wasn't trusting. That. It was just a long shot here, you know. But with God, you can always say, I can trust him. And the main reason you can trust him is because of his very committed love for you. Your faith has this power, this energy that is the love of God, the covenant love of God, the the the. The committed love, the um, very um, sacred and serious commitment of God to love you so much. And he has shown, shown this so much that he said, sent his own son to die for you. You know, Jesus, let me tell you something. This is going completely different to where I was going to preach <laughs> Okay, but anyway, Jesus, have you ever read, uh, read um, John 18, the first five verses? They come to arrest Jesus. And uh, you need to read this, John chapter 18. And uh, they, they said, uh, Jesus comes forward and he said, who are you looking? Uh, who are you looking for? And uh, and they say, uh, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he answers, I am. You know, that's the same name of God, I am. When he said, I am, and, and it says there that there was at least 600 men, Roman soldiers, that came to arrest Jesus with the Pharisees' bodyguards and guards of the temple, and Judas, and they came with weapons, when to with torches, with uh, and, and with uh, 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 you know uh, heavily armed to arrest Jesus because they thought maybe some people are gonna you know create a uh, a, a rebellion here and 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 there uh, you know is gonna be a riot here. And so let's send a whole bunch of soldiers so we can make sure we can arrest Jesus. So it was a whole bunch of soldiers. It says it was a, a whole company of soldiers, that, which means at least between 300 and 600 soldiers. Plus, I, we don't know how many of the bodyguards and, and guards of the temple were there. And, uh, and the high priest's uh, servant was there, the one that got his ear caught. 
and all that. And when Jesus said, I am, all of them, and you, you have to realize that the Roman soldiers were heavily trained. They were the killing machine of their time. They conquered the whole known world. And they were no, uh, you know, wimpy people. <laughs> they were strong. And so when Jesus said, I am, all of them backed up, stepped backwards, and fell off in the spirit. And some people say, why do people fall, you know, under the spirit when they pray for them? Well, because when the supernatural and the natural come you know, uh, in front of each other, uh, one of them, one of them has to yield, and it's going to be the flesh. It's going to be the natural. Amen. Anyway, this at least six hundred people they fell when Jesus said, "I am." Fell down backwards. You imagine uh, the the you know with all the weapons and everything that fe they fell. The amount of dust and confusion that was going on, the torches and uh, all the stuff going on, Jesus could just say, I am, I am, I am, <laughs> a thousand times <laughs> and just walk out of them because they were knocked out. But because of the covenant love, he kept going forward with the plan. He did not stop. He was looking at making a love covenant with you and me, with his own blood. Those animals that were sacrificed in, the, in, in all these covenants in the old time, in the Old Testament, they were just a symbol of the sacrifice of Jesus for the covenant that he was going to make for us. But always a covenant is based on love. And that's what he says that if we pray for having a revelation of how great the love of God is for us, we'll be filled with the, filled with the fullness of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, God's covenant love is the energy of faith. Okay, we we're going to read here in Hebrews 6. Um, let's read with verse 13. We have this one thing clear in what we said today. Is that an oath is basically the expression of the commitment uh, to fulfill the terms of the blood covenant. And there has been many blood covenants in the past. But there's one that we have today that is the covenant that we have with God in the blood of Jesus. When he took the cup, the last supper, when he was with the disciples... He, he broke the bread, you know, just like those animals were broken in half. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. So you know how many times he whip, they whip him in, in the back with this whip that had bone, bones and metal and glass pieces to tear apart his flesh. He was broken. It was broken for us. Those animals were broken, you know, cut in half. And, and he's breaking the bread because also um, when we celebrate the, the communion, in Spanish we call it the Holy Supper, uh, La Santa Cena. Um, when, we, when we do that, is it, the covenant had a, a, a meal, a covenant meal. And that's, that's what the uh, Passover is. Uh, you, you know, they, they, they ate the lamb. They sacrificed the lamb. They put the blood of the lamb on the houses and all that. And it was protection for them. And actually, it was healing. Everybody that partook 
of the Passover. You know how many people are sick when there's a population of two or three million people that are slaves? And uh, they, they were sick. They were poor, broke, and sick. Poor, broke, and sick. Okay? That's, that's a slave. <laughs> a slave don't have no money. <laughs> they don't have doctor's uh, money, you know. They don't have hospital money. And, and, uh, and they're sick. Because of the hard labor. Many of them die there in the field trying to work. Because they would beat him up too if they didn't work. So <laughs> that was worse. <laughs> and so, uh, but the Bible says that when they came out of Egypt, there was no one feeble or sick. They were strong and healthy when they came out. And they also had money because all the Egyptians gave him all the money. So one day they're poor, broke, and sick. The next day they're, they're wealthy, healed, healthy, and powerful. A powerful army. No one could defeat. And what made the difference? The blood that was shed, the sacrifice of the lamb, the blood that was put on the doors, the covenant meal. They ate the covenant meal. They partook. It became one with them. And that's what we do have when we surrender our lives, with, uh, you know, to Jesus. And that's what we have uh, as a symbol when we partake of the um, communion. Yes, supernatural. You can believe for supernatural healing, for prosperity, when we, and we're going to do it sometime soon. Okay, okay, let's go to Hebrews 13, uh, 6, I'm sorry, 6, 13. And it says, when God made his promise to Abraham, okay, so uh, there's promises that God made, right? And it says, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. Or sí mismo, by himself. And so, just, just imagine this. Uh, this when it, it, it's talking about swearing uh, here or, or, or making an oath, it's, it's, it's covenant language. You see this? It, it is a very strong commitment. This is the terms of the covenant. What did he swear? What, he, what was the oath? Verse 14 saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. You know, when Abraham, um, you know, when Abraham uh, first have had a, a, a made this covenant with God, uh, I believe he was 75 years old. And during this 25 years, God keeps, like, um, dealing with him and um, establishing the covenant and um, establishing the, the, the promises that he would have many descendants. And now he's 100 years old. And Sarah is 90 years old. And they still don't have the child. One child. The promise is many descendants, as many as the stars. And blessings. Uh, so, you know... A man that is 75 years old, that is getting this promise, this is hard to believe, <laughs> right? The regular thing would have been, um, I'm too old. My wife cannot have children. Doctor said it, you know. <laughs> Some people say that if doctor said it, it's, it's, the, it's the word of God. No, it's not the word of God. Oh, experience says us. Experience, you know. For 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 so many years, she hasn't been able to have any child, so it must be that she cannot. But you know, when God, when you make a covenant with God, whatever was impossible, if it's promised in this covenant, it becomes possible. 
the covenant love of God gives energy to your faith, energizes your faith. Amen? So now God is promising him you have, will have many descendants and I will bless you. So verse 15, so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. He was 100 years old. Sarah was 90. He was unable to have children in the, in the natural human sense. And, but they believed in the covenant of God. And, and they were uh, sure. It didn't matter what happened. They had a covenant with God. And God was going to fulfill what he swear. So whatever is guaranteed by a blood covenant, the terms of that covenant is the oath. And when we read the Bible, this is, it's like the marriage vows, is the oath of God, what he's going to do because of his commitment, his covenant love. And in verse 16, it says, people swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath Confirm, confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. In other words, after somebody makes a blood covenant and, uh, and makes an oath, there's not, nothing else to argue because it's committed. It's done. It's going to be done. There's nothing else to argue. How much more, more if God makes that kind of covenant and that kind of oath. And so verse 17 says, because God wanted. It's not because he had to, but he wanted. To make the unchanging, in this verse, verse 17. You, you got it over there? Verse 17. Por eso Dios queriendo demostrar claramente a los herederos de la promesa que su propósito es inmutable, la confirmó con un juramento. I read it in Spanish. In verse um, 17 in English. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. We are the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. He confirmed what he uh, wanted to do and make it, it, uh, make, it, uh, make it clear that it was unchanging. He will not change. So he had that uh, uh, sacrifice, and then he makes a promise or an oath about what he's going to fulfill based on that Um. To make it clear. In case it wasn't clear. <laughs> he will be your healer. He will be your provider. But you also. Need to understand that you're entering into a covenant. To where you're committed to do. The terms of the covenant. Or the oath. In verse 18 says. God did this. So that by two unchangeable things. Verse 18. God did this. Th that by, uh, two, uh, by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie. What two things? The body, uh, the broken body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and him, uh, you know, th that is the covenant, the sacrifice. And then his oath, his word saying what he's going to do based on that. Those two things, he will not lie. It's impossible for him to lie in, the, in that. And, and so he did that. So, so we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us might be greatly encouraged. Uh, and and uh, let me see. In the uh, in this in the Spanish says that we so we might have a uh, powerful stimulus or 
uh, help. Bye, Miss Judy. We know we, you have to go to work. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Um, so notice that in here, In the Spanish version, I like how it says, is God did this uh, that through the promise and the oath, there are two realities that are not change changeable, cannot change, in which is impossible for God to lie. We would have a powerful um, encouragement or being stimulated powerfully, or energized powerfully. Energia. Uh, a powerful energy. Uh, those who ha were, um, you know, fleeing, uh, seeking for refuge, and, and, uh, and, and we take hold of the hope that is set before us. So in other words, the, the, uh, the fact that God wouldn't lie in, in his covenant and blood covenant and his oath would produce in you a powerful hope. Verse 19, it says, we have this hope. As an anchor for the soul. Firm and secure. This hope enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. This hope, this expectation, this security that we have because of the sacrifice guaranteeing the terms of the covenant and the oath to fulfill the terms of the covenant produces an expectation so firm that it's like an anchor that goes inside the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. That's the place that is be behind the curtain. Okay? Uh, in Spanish it says, uh, uh, it penetrate, this hope penetrates behind the the curtain, curtain of the sanctuary. Okay, so this is a faith and hope that actually connects yourself with the actual presence of God. So your hope is not just your expectation and, and your faith is not just, uh, uh, you know, I wish or que sera, sera, right? Uh, and uh, there was that song in uh, uh, old time song that uh, it means that whatever we will be, will be. You know, no, it's not that. You know, people without God, that's what they had. Whatever will be, will be. I hope I'm lucky. Right? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> but there's no guarantee on that. But when you sit your hope in this covenant and the oath that promised to fulfill the covenant, your expectation is so firm, is an anchor that goes into the presence of God. And it produces a, a very strong, uh, powerful force in your life. It says that Let's, let's finish reading this. It says, verse 19, we have this hope. And uh, actually, I want to read the, uh, the Greek definition of hope here. And let me find it. Okay. I'm trying to get it. Here it is. Is is a is a word in the, in the Greek language that could be translated as hope, of course, or expectation. What what is an expectation? 
like it's something that you don't have but you are waiting for. Like when you call the you know the the store or the restaurant to order something or you go online and buy something. How many of you buy stuff online? I I buy stuff online. I'm guilty. Okay? And uh and and and, and uh, you know they have my credit card already. And and then so I just order this thing and they send me a receipt, but I don't have it. It says it's going to take two or three days or sometimes five days, business days, and I don't have it. But I have the ex expectation to have it, right? Why? Because the price was paid. Actually, we I made a contract or a covenant with the, the company or whoever that I give this money and they send me this product, right? So it's some somewhat of a covenant. If you give your money, you're expecting to get what you pay for, right? <laughs> so God gave, paid for for a great uh, a great price for uh, the things that He is uh, providing for us. And so um, there is an expectation when I pay online for a product. And it's coming. It would be wrong for me to say, I don't think this is going to work. I don't believe in, in this company. You know, even if you don't believe in this company, they have your money and you better get your product. Right? <laughs> that's, that's not a matter of discussion anymore. You made a covenant with them. You better get it. I'm just not going to say, oh, uh, poor people. No, I want my thing that I bought. <laughs> I pay for it. I work for that money. It, it's, it's, not, it's not just to throw away, uh, uh, yeah. let's buy everything and then don't wait for it. No, you have an expectation that you're going to get what you pay for. Amen. And so... It would be wrong not to believe in the things that God paid for already. It would be an insult, right? Because he paid such a great price for healing, for provision, for the fire of God. He paid for the fire of God to burn brightly in you. So it would be uh, uh, offensive not to want that, not to be... Uh, desiring to be on fire for God. Amen. You can believe for the fire of God because he paid for it. It's called the Holy Spirit. And he lives on the inside of you. And the Bible says, stir up the fire of the gift of God that is inside you. He paid a great price for the Holy Spirit to be able to be there inside of you. And become a fire. Hallelujah. Okay. So let me be. Uh, let me finish with this idea. I'm going to tell you a story. Actually I'm going to read some verses. Um, this is. Um, second. Samuel. I thought I was not going to read it, but I feel like I need to read it. <laughs> Chapter 21, verse 1. Okay, I'm going to read this story. I want you to see this because I want you to see how serious it is to break a covenant. And we, that's one, one of the things that uh, we have studied here in this series. Um, but, okay, let me tell you a story. We don't have time to read it over there. But Joshua, chapter 9 and 10. There's this people, the Gibeonites, this people... They knew the Israelites were coming. They were going to take the land that God had promised to Abraham. 
And they had a covenant with God. And they were defeating everybody. This guy said, we can see how they came out of Egypt. How they destroyed um, um, Jericho. They just shouted and the, the, the big walls came down. This is a powerful God that they have. We don't have that one. We made one out of with our own hands, and he doesn't do that. <laughs> they were smart enough to know the only way we can survive because they have a covenant and they have committed to eliminate all these sinful people in this land because there is no, there was no, they were already reached the, the point of no return. They were not repenting. They said, "We're going to do something. We're going to pretend." We come from afar. We're not from these people that they have to destroy. And they have committed themselves in their covenant, in their covenant with their God to destroy this population here. Because they were so corrupted that they were corrupt, corrupting other people. And they were going to, in fact, the survivors of the, uh, the, the peoples that were there, they corrupted Israel. And they were part to blame, partly to blame for uh, the, the fact that Israel broke their covenant with God. But anyway, they said, we're going to deceive them. We're going to dress ourselves with old clothes and raggy shoes and, uh, all, you know, cr crumbly bread and say, well, this bread was fresh when we, we came out to meet you. So long ago. Now look, it's moldy and old. And look at our clothes. They were new when we came out in our travel, in our journey. And now look, they're all ripped apart. We have troubles from so far. And you know what? The Israelites didn't pray to God and ask him, shall we believe these guys? Because they said, we heard of the power of your God. And we want to make a covenant with you. We, we don't want to be your enemies. We know your God is too powerful. We want to be your friends. Covenant friends. Okay? And uh, you don't have to go there. But um, in Joshua 9, 14, it says, The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. They didn't ask God. Uh, they didn't ask the question to God. Shall we believe them? In verse nine, uh, 15, Joshua 9, 15 says, Then Joshua made a treaty or a covenant of peace with them to let them live. And the leaders of the assembly ratified it with a, by oath. The leaders of the assembly ratify it by oath. Lo ratificaron por juramento. Okay, so there's the oath. They made a covenant and then they ratified the covenant with an oath. Okay? Okay, so then we have uh, King Saul later on, much later on, we have King Saul. Remember King Saul? He was a mess. <laughs> he, was, he started w good, but he, he was humble when he started, but then he became uh, proud. Okay, so, uh, and, and you know, he wanted to do things to please God, but his, his own way. He really didn't really look up to God to see, how do I do it? He wanted to do it his own way. This is one of the things he did. We're going to read here. So, let's remember. Is, uh, Israel and um, uh, Gibeon, the Gibeonites, they have those Gibeonites. E ellos, uh, they, they had a covenant. Correct? 
Somebody would say, oh, but it was by deception. They faked to be somebody else to make this covenant. It doesn't matter. They had a covenant. Once you you have a deal, it's like Pastor Kel was saying in her, her show that she liked deal or no deal. When they had a deal, they had a deal. It was signed with blood. There's no turning back. And so, uh, and so when when the Israelites realized that they had they had been deceived, some people wanted to go and kill them, the Gibeonites. But the leader said, "No, we gave an oath. We made a covenant. We gave an oath. We we cannot." The covenant is we let them live. So Joshua said, I'm going to let them live, but they're going to be our servants. They have to carry the water, cut the, the wood. You know, they're the servants. But we won't kill them. We will not kill them because we have a covenant of peace with them. But Saul was trying to be, to show that he was so zealous to so fervent that he was even killing the Gibeonites. During his, he almost exterminated the Gibeonites. Get this. Now Saul is dead. And now King is, the, uh, I mean, King David is now the king. And listen to what's going on now, okay? Verse 1 says, during the reign of David, there was a famine um, for three successive years. So David saw the face of the Lord. The Lord said, it is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. Okay, so this is what's going on. King is now the, uh, I mean, David is now the king. And he's reigning. He's seeking after God. He's not yet in sin or anything. And all of a sudden, it stops raining. And there is a drought and a, a famine. For three years. And he's like, okay, let me ask God. <laughs> Something is not right here. He, he's our God. He's our provider. By, co provider. By covenant, he said he would make the heavens uh, open for us. And he would bless us in the promised land with water, with rain, with crops, with everything. He's, we have that covenant with God. So what is wrong? You know, sometimes when, you know, things are not going well. And you said, God is not doing his part. It's not God's fault. I can assure you. You have to check what you're doing wrong. So he asked God, and God said, i tell you what's wrong. Saul almost killed all the Gibeonites, and they had a covenant with you. So that's why it's not, uh, there's no rain for three years. That's serious stuff, right? So sometimes we need to ask ourselves, what, what am I doing wrong here? Because things are not going the way they should be going. Don't blame God. What am I doing wrong? What, what did I allow? Verse 2 says, the king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now, the Gibeonites were not a part of Israel, but they were survivors of the Amorites. You know, all those people that, uh, amore, amorreos, creo que es en Spanish. <laughs> amorreos, yeah. It's hard to, let me say that, it's hard to translate names into Spanish. Say this, uh, Pam. It's hard to translate names into Spanish. Oh, especially these names. Amen. <laughs> I, I mean, you, you can choose for your children some of the names here, right? 
just for entertainment. Okay. Uh, anyway, they were survivors of the uh, Amorites, and the Israelites had sworn to spare them, but Saul in his seal for Israel and Judah had tried to annihilate them. Annihilate them. So, uh, to kill them. So, what kind of zeal is this? Because you you're, you have ferv fervor or, or zeal for, for God, but you have to do it according to knowledge. Your, your zeal shouldn't override your, your, the knowledge of the Word of God. Some people are so fervent, but they have no knowledge of the Word, and, and they do things supposedly in their zeal for God, but actually they're doing it against God. You know, for example, if you love God, you hate sin, but you don't hate sinners. So it would be wrong to hate some a sinner because that's not the way it goes. You love the person. You actually see that you could be in the same condition and have compassion for them. So some people in their seal, they, oh, I don't want to be close to sinners, but... Uh, it's true. You don't you don't want to be intimate with uh, with sin and sinners, but you want to be compassionate towards them and bring them over to the light of God. Amen. So in your in his seal, he tried to kill them all. Thank God he didn't succeed. But now look what the, David has to do to repair the damage. David asked the Gibeonites, Gibeonitas, what shall I do for you? How shall I make atonement so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? In other words, we're, we broke the covenant with you guys. Now it's up to you to tell us what can we do to repair the damage so you can bless us so we can have some rain and some food or we're going to die here after three years. <laughs> right? You're desperate, right? They give you a nice answer. We have no right to the man's silver or gold from Saul or his family. Nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. Because they also had a covenant with Israel. So they were not supposed to say, oh, yeah, we're going to kill some of you and then get even. That didn't work like that either because they had a covenant. So David said, what do you want me to do for you, David asked. In verse 5, they answered the king, as for the man who destroyed us, that's Saul, and plotted against us so that we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel. So he almost, you know, I think the survivors were people that were not in Israel from the same people that have fled. But basically Saul killed them all inside Israel. And it was wrong. They had a covenant. Verse 6, let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed and their bodies exposed before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen one. So the king said, I will give them to you. Verse 7, the king spared Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan. He didn't kill Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Uh, for because of the oath before the Lord between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. So, okay. So, you, I don't know. You remember Mephibosheth said he was the son of Jonathan. And uh, David and, and Jonathan had made a covenant. So, he was protecting the son of Jonathan because he had a covenant with Jonathan. But Saul had other children. With some concubines and all the people. So he, he looked for other um, descendants, which he didn't have a covenant with. 
And he gave them to the Gibeonites. And they hang them in a place there where they, they mention in Gibeah of, uh, uh, of Saul there. And so, but basically, that was a way for them to be blessed again and have crops and harvest and everything. So can you see how serious it is to break a covenant here? This was not just, uh, a, oh, we broke the contract. How much can I pay you to repair the damage? Or No, it wasn't that. And, and they understood, we cannot demand anybody from Israel to be killed because we have a covenant with you. But the family of this man that killed us, seven of his descendants, male descendants, be given to us and we will hang, hang them before the Lord. So verse 8, but the king took our mourning and Mephibosheth, another Mephibosheth, but not the same one. The two sons of Ayaz, daughter uh, uh, Rispa, whom she had born to Saul together with the five sons of Saul's daughter Mirab, whom she had born to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the Melholatai. And so... There, you can practice some. I knew it was going to be hard to translate that. Just say, he he got two children from uh, one of uh, Saul's wives and five children of, uh, uh, grandchildren of Saul from, from his daughter and gave them to the Gibeonites. So, uh, what are we learning here? Verse 9, is he handed them over to the Gibeonites to kill them and expose their bodies on a hill before the Lord. All seven of them together fell together. They were put to death during the first days of the harvest, just as the barley harvest was beginning. Okay, and there's more there in the story, but that's enough for you to see that um, you just don't break a covenant. <laughs> you have to study the covenant and fulfill the covenant. On the other hand, God doesn't break the covenant, and he will fulfill the covenant when you walk in faith in that covenant. And his love is the energy for that faith. You can trust him. He has a very committed love. Okay. Did you learn something today? The great love of God for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How committed is God to fulfill what he said in his word? How committed is God to make things happen for you? When things are not happening, uh, you know, for Abraham, he had to wait 25 years. So I'm not saying that everything has to be super quick. But when things are going the wrong way, you know, <clears throat> famine, uh, you know, sickness and stuff. That's completely the, because he has committed to heal you, to provide for you, to keep you on fire. <laughs> when things are uh, going the wrong way, we need to examine ourselves and say, you know, what is it that I'm not doing right in this covenant with you, in this relationship with you? And on the other hand, how serious is God to fulfill his word? Amen. How, how serious is he about loving you? How committed is he to love you? He's so committed to that that, that it gives energy to your love and your hope. Amen. All right. So... Today, I, I just wanted to invite you to uh, really examine yourselves because the relationship we have with God is that serious, is that deep, is that powerful. And, and, and we need to uh, make sure we understand the relationship. <laughs> we told the story that, you know, uh, just 
this is a real story, a, a, a true life story, uh, that uh, we had this lady got married in, in, in our youth group when we were pa youth pastors in Colombia, and, and uh, uh, they invited us to visit them and eat dinner or something. And um, when we get there, she had some picture of a guy and on the drawer, uh, on the dresser in the uh, in her room. She, they were showing us the whole apartment. And so we said, is this a picture of your dad when he was young or something? And, we, and she said, no, that's a picture of one of my old boyfriends. And we said, this is not right. Do you understand that in this covenant of marriage that you have, you should get rid of everything that is not in uh, a part of the um, uh, this relationship. And she said, well, tell my husband that he needs to get rid of all the pictures of girlfriends or ex-girlfriends that he has in his wallet. <laughs> and we realized we were in, in the middle of, we're in the middle of a combat zone here. <laughs> we just got invited to this uh, war here. And what is going on? And, and really, um, they, they really didn't understand, especially the guy. Th he did not understand. She was kind of right to do what he, she was doing just to try to get him. But he was keeping his relationships like he wasn't even married. Okay, so they end up divorcing and everything, but, you know, they never understood what kind of covenant they had with each other. Uh, he didn't, anyway. I think she probably was hoping that it was going to work, but he was not in there for, uh, you know, for the relationship. I don't know what he wanted, but, you know, he didn't want anything good. Um, and so that marriage had to, to uh, fail. But we cannot allow our relationship with God to fail. We need to work on our part. We cannot have other loves and God at the same time. You know, we cannot be friends with the world and not friends with, uh, you know. And, and, and we need to understand that the, uh, the word friend is is a title given to Abraham after he did a, had a covenant with with God. All right. So I, I hope you you got something out of this. Um, but I, again, is is how serious is the commitment from God to fulfill His covenant and His oath, and how serious should we be? Should we be? to fulfill our covenant with God. But as I said, God's covenant love enables us because God's covenant love is the energy of faith. Hallelujah. No, I got it, Pastor Paul. Sorry. <laughs> I guess it's running out of battery. I guess it's time to quit now. Hallelujah. Praise God. Does it sound like good news? It is good news. Also, it, it, it helps us understand the relationship we have with God. We really, how can, you know, this, this couple that I'm mentioning, I mean, we, we have compassion for them. I mean, if, especially for her. She was, I think she was deceived. Um, but anyway... Uh, it's an example of how people might enter a relationship without understanding what is involved in it. And, and some believers really don't understand what is involved in the relationship, relationship that we have with God. And it's a, it's a complete commitment to God. But He will enable you with His love to have a strong faith and hope to uh, be strong and fulfill your part of the covenant. Amen? All right. God bless you. Hallelujah. And um, let me see.
Uh, we're going to just uh, change gears here for a second. We're going to take our uh, offering and um, our tithes and offerings. Uh, and, um, and really, when we understand uh, the, uh, the covenant with God, he has, uh, in his commandments, established this to, for us to, to be givers, um, to uh, help the kingdom of God advance on earth. And uh, the church need, needs that to be empowered to have resources to reach the lost and to uh, be a light for the community. And even Jesus, was when, when he was here on earth, he, uh, he had people that actually uh, financed and uh, uh, funded, better to say, uh, funded his ministry. Um, and we're still doing the same thing that Jesus was doing here on earth. Amen. We still want to do what God wants us to do. And uh, we want to, to be givers as God is a giver. The word of God says to imitate God as dear children. He's a giver. I want to be a giver. Amen. Uh, but if you really study this subject, which I'm not going to try to make a, a deep study right now. But in Hebrews chapter 7, Jesus is the high priest that we now have in this new covenant. We have a new covenant with a new high priest. And what did priest, uh, the high priest do? He would receive the tithes and offerings from the people and he would bless the people back. Right? So he was like a media mediator between God and the people. And that's what Jesus is. He's our, the only mediator. It's not the Pope. It's not anybody else. It's Jesus. Who is the mediator. And when we give our tithes and offerings. He receives them. Even though we receive them down here on earth. Is, he is, is actually given to him. That's our faith. That we're. Uh, like as ministers. We, we give part of our tithes to, to the assemblies of God. And, and, and part to the church, and, uh, and that, that's all, all good and, and, and well. And, but actually, we believe we're giving it to Jesus. And he's blessing us back. And that's part of our covenant. You don't have a priest if you don't have a covenant. Hallelujah. Let me turn this one on. You don't have, let me say this. You don't need a priest if you don't have a covenant. You only need a priest when you have a covenant. The reason why Jesus is our high priest is because we have a covenant with God. And he's our provider. Amen. All right. Praise God. Okay. So, Pastor Paul, pray for the offering and... Receive the offering. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've entered into covenant with us and the blessings that you've given to us through that covenant. And Lord, we ask you just to bless each one now for the week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Don't forget that we have um, a special guest, uh, Brother Bert and Carolyn Farias uh, come in at uh, the beginning of um, uh, January. Um, would you remind me the, remind me the dates, uh, Pastor Pam? Eight and nine. Eight and nine. So it's a Saturday and a Sunday. So we probably have the meeting at six on Saturday and then Sunday regular time at, at, at 10. And uh, it's going to be a special time with them. And so we're expecting, we're praying, and uh, we want you to invite people. It's, it's, it's going to be a special time with those uh, two uh, special uh, guest speakers. 
and ministers, um, they have a very special ministry. And um, recently they have been doing uh, something called Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost Forums. Uh, Foro, Foro del Espíritu Santo. Uh, donde, where, where they, um, where they uh, allow um, seasoned ministers, uh, people with experience, to uh, actually flow in the gifts of the Spirit, uh, prophecy, tongues with interpretation, and healing and other things, and um, just to show the body of Christ how to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. So that's a, a really interesting, and, and you can look for them. I think it's Holy Fire Ministries. You can look for them in um, uh, Facebook. It's really good uh, what they do. Um, it, they were involved uh, with the revival in, in Brownsville, Pensacola, for years with the... Uh, a school of a fire school mi uh, ministry uh with um uh, reverend um brown is it um what is his michael brown yeah michael brown which is a good I, I i like him i like his his teaching and his uh uh his ministry uh and so uh you know but bear fairies was uh, somewhat connected with them and uh, and the revival of uh, Pensacola for five years. So that and also he was a missionary in Africa, and he started uh, uh, you know Bible schools and uh, reach a lot of people for for the Lord in Africa as well. So that was also part of his uh, uh, story here. And uh, so we want to just receive from them and and so be praying for those meetings. Invite people, pray for people that they will come to that, uh, and 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 we're expecting a, a great turnout and also great uh, uh, testimonies and 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 reports, praise reports. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Uh, uh, thank you for being with us. We're, we're honored to have you. Uh, Julio Cesar is the first time that it com comes here. Welcome. And Jamie, his his wife, thank you. Uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, but thank you everybody that to, uh, to to be part of our, our ministry here. Amen. God bless you. Okay. Next Sunday. Okay. So next Sunday we have. The uh, birthdays of uh, November, uh, uh, which Ronnie's birthday is this month, right? The 30th of November? Okay. And then we also are going to do like our Thanksgiving dinner together. So please, uh, after the, I guess after the service, we'll have that. But if you're online, you will have to come here to be able to... <laughs> To partake, we cannot send you anything online. Uh, we cannot commit to send you the turkey via FedEx or anything like that. You'd have to come here. Uh, and maybe you will even taste my mom's empanadas. And so uh, we're going to have fun after the service. Okay, God bless you. Bye. You'll be 80.